Today is day five of the Israel-Hamas war. Joining us right now with the latest is former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State Mark Kimmett. Um, uh, Mark, thank you very much for joining us, uh, General Kimmett. Let's talk a little bit about where things stand. Overnight, I, I think the biggest news is that Hezbollah started attacking from the north, um, attacking an Israeli post that was there in the very northern part of the country. Um, that raises the questions of, about whether this will expand, whether this is more than a situation involving uh, Hamas and Gaza and the West Bank. What, what, what do you think? What's the latest that you take out of this? Well, I think that was a clear message sent by President Biden last night, uh, as well as the fact that we are putting an aircraft carrier and other assets in the region. He said this is not to go against Hamas. This is to send a clear message to other potential adversaries uh, not to get involved in this. Uh, if we, as you say, get Hezbollah involved in this, uh, West Bank militants, Pidge, uh, Al-Qaeda inside of the Sinai, we're taking this conflict to a completely different level than it is right now. It will be very dangerous. But it, with Hezbollah already firing these, uh, this, this strike into the north, is that something that is surprising in any way? Is it something that says, okay, this is one thing, but it would be different if they actually took and had ground troops that came in as well? Well, my personal view is there were a limited number of rockets. Hezbollah had to show its own members that they were showing support. Uh, at this point, there hasn't been a serious ground incursion, no more than a few rockets. The Israelis did go in and attack a couple of Palestinian Islamic Jihad units. But at this point, we're hoping that it's simply a demonstration and publicity on the part of Hezbollah, not a sign of a greater military effort to come from them. We'll, we'll know in the days ahead. Do the Israelis see it the same way? Uh, if, from all reports, it sounds like the Israeli defense forces are incredibly angry, incredibly fired up and ready to go. So will they sit back and say, OK, this is not a huge incursion, too? Or do they see it a little differently? Well, I think their major focus right now is on Gaza. Uh, they would not want to get into a two-front war. Gaza is in the south. Uh, Hezbollah and Lebanon is in the north. Uh, that would do nothing but uh, draw more forces away from a preparation for a Gaza fight. So no, Israel does not want to see it. Uh, and, and candidly, neither does the United States. So I, I think at this point, all we can do is hope and cross our fingers that the Northern Front uh, does not blow up. But right now, the focus is on Gaza. And what can you tell us about that focus in Gaza, where things stand? Well, it, again, I think one of the problems is we continue to talk about a potential ground invasion, a war, a conventional operation in Gaza. I think we need to be looking at this more as a hostage rescue operation than a war. Um, the Israeli military units are sort of betwixt and between. If they go in too hard, they risk the lives of the hostages. But if they go in too soft, uh, failure of the mission. So this is, this is a very, very complicated operation. Uh, Hamas knows exactly what it's doing. They know the policy of the Israelis towards hostages. Uh, and they really, in many ways, have the Israeli military, ground military forces in a conundrum. We, we've heard about the situation with hostage takings. In the past, Israel has been very open to exchanging hostages for prisoners. In, in one case, I think back uh, in the not too distant past, they, they gave more than 1,200 Palestinian prisoners for exchange for one Israeli soldier. Um, are they rethinking that hostage policy just because of the idea that it, it motivates? Uh, the idea of more hostage-taking? Yeah, that's a very good question. Now, up to this point, of course, predominantly the hostage-taking was of the military. And there, the, the Israelis always had to consider what they call the Hannibal policy, which is what's more important, the mission or the lives of the hostages. That's a completely different issue here when you're talking about women, children, civilians. Uh, I don't think that... Uh, Israel is going to change their hostage policy in the near term uh, because of the fact that the hostages are civilians. They may relook at it in the long run, but I think in the near term, they're probably going to stick to their hostage policy, which is whatever it takes. 
General Kemet, just in terms of this spreading beyond, it's not just Hezbollah that people are watching, it's also Iran and whether Iran was behind this. The Wall Street Journal reported earlier several days ago that Iran did plan all of this, green-lighted the operation and helped them with their planning for the entire situation. That, that, that has not been something that the United States administration has said that it's found evidence of. Where, where does this stand and, and, and what will that process take place? Because if you talk about really expanding things in the Middle East, this would be it. Well, it wasn't just what the journals, Reuters reported that as well. I think that the uh, administration may be trying to be a little too clever with their words. Uh, they're saying they do not see any direct involvement of Iran. They are interpreting that, I think, or trying to suggest that there were no Iranian ground troops involved in this mission. But look, this was an incredibly sophisticated operation, something that before this time uh, was seen to be well beyond the capacity of the planners inside of Hamas. On the other hand, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, who has been operated, operating in the region for years, uh, this is... This is old hat to them. So to think that somehow the IRGC of the Iranians uh, was not involved in this, uh, this mission has uh, their fingerprints all over this. Hey, General, one other question I had was just the idea of whether you think there could be a second or third or even fourth wave from the Hamas side of all of this. You know, all of this happened in one sort of big early wave, and then you've seen Israel retaliating. But what happens sort of on the other side afterwards? Or, or have they used all of their ammunition and all of their people? Well, they've not used all their ammunition or all their people because those are the ones that are waiting for right. uh, trailers to come in. Uh, there's plenty of small arms ammunition that they can be used in the streets of Gaza. They have, they have hundreds of thousands of willing civilians and Hamas members that will fire at any Israeli soldier that comes into Gaza. They may not have as many rockets. There may be a second wave. Uh, they probably don't have the number of rockets they did at the beginning. But they certainly have enough small arms to fight in the streets of Gaza. To, to, strike, to, to fight in the streets of Gaza, but, but, not, but not necessarily to, to, to endeavor to make a second incursion in, uh, into Israel. You know, yeah, you don't know if they've got the capacity to do that. I think now that uh, everybody's, as military expression, everybody's guns are up inside of Israel, uh, the, the reserves are activated. There may be a couple of small attempts to get in there, but certainly nothing of the scale that we saw in the first operation.